MMA Roadshow, episode number 413. My name is John Morgan. Cold Coffee is not with me, or to be more accurate, I am not with him. I uh, <laughs> had a little bit of a crazy change in the schedule today, but uh, it's an exciting change, uh, but one that I was not uh, expecting, and unfortunately that precluded me from going to uh, UFC Fight Night 220 Media Day, where Cold Coffee currently is, uh, probably cursing up a storm because he ended up having to ask a whole lot of questions that he didn't think he was going to have to answer if I was there, or, or have to ask. He wouldn't be answering questions. You know what I mean. He ended up having to do more work because I didn't go to Media Day. But um, kind of a cool thing. I got um, I got some furniture delivered today, which was uh, pretty cool. Uh, I had been – or does – it's cool and it's not cool. Um, if anybody has ever used uh, Wayfair.com, are you guys familiar with this website? It's the uh, first time I, I used it um, and had been wanting to get some new furniture for my house for a while. Look, this is MMA Roadshow, right? But hey, we're sharing. We're sharing. Uh, I'd been wanting to get some new furniture for the house, kind of redesign a couple areas. You know, we've all been redesigning our homes over these last couple of years, making space more efficient and using things to our advantage. So anyway, I had this idea for furniture. Uh, kept kind of putting it off, putting it off. Finally found something I wanted. Uh, my wife been bugging me because I had sold her on this idea of how I wanted it to look and where I wanted things to move and all that. Uh, and then I just never did it because I'm always busy. And she's like, are you going to get this done? You got me excited about the idea of doing it. And then you, you didn't do it. And so anyway, uh, around the turn of the year, um, I found this stuff on Wayfair.com and I ordered it. Uh, and uh, I ordered a couple bar stools for my kitchen. I got a little, you know, countertop area, but I wanted some nice bar stools, you know, so you can sit there. So I ordered those. Those came in, and then I ordered uh, this kind of sectional couch type thing that's going in this kind of entertainment area that we have. And so when I went to order it uh, on Wayfair.com, uh, and I'm not trying to slam them. I'm not trying to plug them because I'm halfway in between. I like the bar stools that I got, but here's what happened with my couches: a uh, little sectional thing that I wanted. Uh, it says it's in stock and it'll be, it'll be there by Saturday. It was like a Tuesday or something. I'm like, Oh, we'll get it this week. Place the order, takes the money out of my account. Uh, and then says, Oh, by the way, back order till March 27th. This is like the beginning of January. I'm like, how can you back order something to March 27th? How does that even work? How do you, how do you know right now on like January 5th? That it's going to be March 27th when you have this. But but I get it. I know how the furniture thing works, right? Like, uh, they don't necessarily just have everything sitting in stock. They kind of build them uh, when they have orders come in or whatever. So I, I got it. I mean, I wasn't totally pissed. But I was like, come on, man. You could have just said, this will be available on March 27th. And said, you got me excited about getting my furniture in. Anyway. So along the way, uh, it got backed up again from March 27th to March 30th. At that point, who cares, right? Three days, no big deal, whatever. Awesome. Then I wake up this morning to a message, well actually it was late last night, that the furniture is on its way and it's going to arrive today, a month early. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I had to skip out so I could be here to help today and I, and I love it. It's uh, I'm excited that everything's come in and we're getting it all set up and uh, taking a break from that to, to come and talk to you lovely fine people uh, before we continue on with that and soccer practice and all the rest of it. But... I tell you all that to explain why I was not at UFC Media Day uh, for UFC Fight Night 220. But I am excited about this card that's happening this weekend. First of all, we had UFC Fight Night 219 last week. And of course, we talked about it on the and a half episode over at patreon.com slash the MMA Roadshow. Not, uh, not the greatest of cards, but not the worst card either, especially um, you know the big move with, with Aaron Blanchfield. A uh, huge win for her and... Man, uh, really got her some incredible rankings. Uh, once again, uh, h higher than I had it, if I'm going to be honest with you. So uh, I'm sure you guys have seen it by now, but uh, moves all the way up to number three in the, in the flyweight rankings. And then obviously uh, debuted on the pound for pound list as well at number eight, um, which is pretty damn incredible. I, I did not have it quite that high. I, I I don't know, man. I, you know, and I think you know it's funny because I, I you know, for years myself and, and gorgeous George Garcia would talk about the rankings, because uh, we were the two that really kind of ran the rankings at MMA Junkie. Basically, um, for a while we did it. We're like, I kind of liked it when we did this for a while. We gave everybody one division. Everybody on staff had one division, um, and I kind of liked that because I felt like that person could be incredibly responsible for knowing the ins and outs 
of every divi- uh, every, every athlete in that division. So when you say, you know, why did somebody get moved? It's like, dude, this person is an expert on that division. This is their division. Um, and then you don't have to worry about everything because what we used to do is try to compile and everybody would vote, and then you have it, it just turns into a lengthy process when you get a lot of people. So that's what we tried to do. After a while, I think some people didn't like doing rankings, um, and I think George uh, just really did like doing rankings. So he said, you know what, man, I know some people are kind of out on this. Let me just take it all, and uh, and that's the way I think they still do it to this day, where George kind of does everything. Then what I would do is review kind of his suggestions and be like, uh, you know, this makes sense. Hey, I don't think this makes sense. Let me argue why, and we'd go back and forth, and he might see my side, or he might insist on his, and we you know, come to some conclusion or whatever. But... George and I kind of had the same philosophy, which is these massive moves up and down um, kind of aren't fair to a, to a degree. I mean, I feel like, you, you know, it's, it's, I think he, he used to phrase it as slow in, slow out. You know, it's just, you don't just shoot up the ranks to number one and you don't immediately fall out either. So um, anyway, I, I, I was a little bit slower with my rankings. I had Blanchfield at number five. Uh, in my latest flyweight rankings, and I'm actually trying to pull up my, my votes right now, and I didn't put her on the pound-for-pound pound list at all. Um, and sometimes I wonder if, I, if, I, if I'm being too stingy with it a little bit, you know. Um, I went over to look at MMA Junkies rankings, actually, um, and interestingly enough, they this week uh, did not put her on pound-for-pound, pound, but they did put her at number three in women's flyweight, which is higher than I have it, so... Um, I guess in some ways they see it the way I do. In some ways they don't. Yeah, I've got – so my women's flyweight ring is obviously Shevchenko is your champion. I still got Manon Firo as number one. I've got Tyler Santos as number two. Caitlin Chukagian is number three. Um, I know that can be uh, a little bit problematic um, because she does have the loss to Jessica Andrade, but – uh, there's a little space in between them. Sometimes these little, uh, I think I'll, I'll give George credit as well. You call it like a round robin where A beat B, but B beat C, but C beat A or something like that. Um, so Jessica Andrade did beat Caitlin Chukagian. So you could easily go uh, where I went was three Chukagian, four Grasso, five Blanchfield, six Andrade. I mean, I guess if you wanted to, you could say uh, that knocks Chukagian down to number seven, I guess, put her behind Andrade, but I didn't. It's I don't know. So, <laughs> sometimes your head starts spinning a little bit when you talk about these rankings. But uh, either way, great win. Um, great, great win for Aaron Blanchfield. And, you know, I, look, she deserves a, a, a huge fight next. I'm a, I'm a little bit a little bit surprised, I guess, that uh, – oh, wow, and I just noticed in the junkie rankings, Blanchfield's number three, and uh, that includes Liz Carmouche. Uh, as number two, as I look at their rankings. That really means Blanchfield is the number one contender. How do they have Menno Fioro down at seven and Tyler at six? Okay, see? See, now we <laughs> I, I guess they went with that. So they have Blanchfield, Andrade, Juliana Velasquez. You got to take her out. You got Tyler Santos, Menno, Chukagan all the way down at eight. Wow. Yeah, some difference in my my vote. Um, I don't know. I hear a lot of people saying, you know, Blanchfield for the winner of Shevchenko Grasso. Um, I just first of all, I felt like Tyler Santos should be getting a a, a rematch. That fight was so close last time out, and I know Shevchenko um, had had some injuries that she was dealing with, and she doesn't talk about it a lot. I think she mentioned it a little bit, but we had heard that kind of from people around the PI, basically, uh, not people working there, just other fighters uh, that were in there that said, like, dude, I don't think she's looking good. Um, But we had heard that kind of secondhand, you know, going in there. So uh, knew that it wasn't great for her and that she was dealing with some things. But she doesn't really like to talk about it, make excuses, those sort of things. But um, anyway, I thought Tyler deserved a rematch. That fight was close. I had the fight score for Shevchenko, but I know a lot of a lot of people didn't, right? A lot of people had it going the other way. So when it's that close, I feel like you should do it again. Um, and then I, I just, I mean, how do you get away from Manuel Firo? I just, you know, you look at the win streak that she's on. Um, you look at the win over Chukagian, which is kind of like the, uh, the, the – I mean, I hate the term gatekeeper because it sounds negative and it's not. But, you know, that she was the one you had to beat to get to that next level. She did it. So how do you not give her a title shot? So I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm very impressed by the win Blanchfield had. I'm very impressed by her at 23 years old. I'm very impressed by the game that she has. Um, I 
uh, definitely. I mean, a number one contender fight next? Absolutely. But I don't know. I, I just I just can't see that as like, now I got to see. Now, listen, stylistically, she could be a problem for Valentina Shevchenko. And that's why I think people are excited. That's the part I do get that people are excited about, right? Like, God bless Alexa Grasso. She is so fun to watch. And she's always been a, a – a, um, you know, you know, a great interview and, and a, a fun fighter, and she's she's you know wearing the Mexican flag and and repping that country. So you know, a great opportunity for Mexico, which is doing big things in MMA. But you get down to the point of like, so you're gonna outstrike Valentina Shevchenko? Like, that's not easy. <laughs> and I and I get that right. Like, it's tough to outstrike Valentina Shevchenko. She's just so slick on the feet. Um, polished in her striking, it's difficult to do that. So to pick somebody to outstrike her seems kind of tough. But if you could outgrapple her, if you could wrestle her, if you could take her to the ground, um, and Aaron Blanchard looks like she absolutely has the opportunity to do that, right? Um, you know, doesn't want to have an opening round like she did against Andrade, where she's stuck standing the whole time because I don't think that would go her way. Just, I mean, she she held her own there, right? But I just think Shevchenko is a little bit more polished and fluid in her, in her combinations and that sort of thing, rather than just you know, loading up on the heavy hooks or what have you. So, anyway, I get why people are excited for the matchup, both in terms of stylistic nature and in terms of kind of the hot hand, so to speak. Who's got the headlines behind him? Who's got the buzz behind him? But I just don't, it just, it just seems a little fast to me, man. Again, now I go back to my rankings. Is it me? Is it? Is it I'm just too slow to, to let things slide and to let things move and not adopt them right away? Maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe I'm... I'm the old crotchety dude saying, oh, you haven't deserved it yet. You haven't earned your way in there yet. Um, but I just feel like there's more work to do. So I think a number one contender fight next uh, would be fantastic. Um, you know, you know, what about Blanchfield Firo? What about Blanchfield Santos? You know, it was supposed to be Blanchfield Santos. Why not put it back together before a number one contender? You know, if Tyler wants a rematch, now it's clear. Because at first, when you made – I mean, honestly, when they first made Tyler and Blanchfield, I, I kind of felt like for Tyler Santos, I was like, well, you kind of got screwed over there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I thought you should be getting the rematch, and now you're stuck fighting the up-and-coming stud prospect. But now – it actually kind of makes sense, right? Because now you're like, if you're Tyler, you say, well, she's the one that everybody thinks should get the title side next. I think I deserve my rematch. I need to get in there. But where does that leave my own Firo as well? And I think some people think she has a good chance against Shevchenko, even though she's more of a striker by nature. She's also a very physically dominant striker by nature, whereas, you know, Grasso is kind of the form of straw weight moving up. Uh, whereas Furo is like the one that has the hard cut to get to 125. So even though it's kind of striker versus striker, I think it's a little bit more appealing. So um, interesting times at Women's Flyweight. It really is. And again, I, I, I want to say that all, that I'm not putting down Aaron Blanchard by any stretch of the imagination. I thought that was an amazing performance. And, and, and I am one of the ones, as I'm sure you guys are, the hardcores, um, that has had her tapped for greatness. You know, But it just seems like you, know, you, 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 you look at, you know, the wins and, and to have, like, again, I have her at number five, and, 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 and that means she has a win over number six, Jessica Andrade. She doesn't have a win over anybody else ranked, right? Um, I mean, if you go back, obviously, um, you know, a long time, but, you know, it, it, I, we, another, another thing that I'll let you in on, we always value the last three years is what we look at, uh, at least what we used to look at at Junkie is what we talked about. But the wins there, you know, Molly McCann, J.J. Aldrich, Miranda Maverick, Sarah Alpar, Brogan Walker, nobody in the UFC rankings. And so I guess that's another reason why I feel like you've got to have a couple of ranked wins to get there. You know, at least a couple. I know you're, not, you're never going to go, you know, nobody's ever going to take out 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. Okay, it's not going to go step by step. You're going to skip some along the way. But I'd just like to see more ranked wins. So uh, interesting to see what's next. We'll definitely be talking about it next week with Valentina Shevchenko as we get ready for UFC 285. So that's uh, – looking forward to that. The big pay-per-view. I will make sure that I'm there for media day for the big pay-per-view uh, and will not let life get in the way. Although, I'll be honest with you, staying home was um, uh, kind of a godsend in a lot of ways. Uh, I got a lot of other stuff done as well today while we were working on that. Uh, my march is crazy, and I'm so I, I'm so excited for this. Um, you guys know that, you know, part of the reason I left MMA Junkie was I wanted to pursue more commentary options, right? Uh, I wanted to take part in that. I love doing it, and I, and, and I, I enjoy the heck out of it. Um, and I'm so blessed for what I get to do uh, this March, man. So check this out. March 3rd, 
I'll be calling Tough Enough here in Las Vegas. So obviously I've been with them for a long time. They were doing all amateur for years and years. Now I'll do Pro-Am um, with the pro shows going on Fight Pass. This one will be at the Sahara. It'll be at the pool, actually, which I'm kind of interested to see the setup out there. Um, kind of a VIP style, you know, cabanas and, and stuff. It should be a pretty cool little scene. So that's March 3rd. Of course, the next night is UFC 285. So next week, got the UFC 285 Fight Week here in Las Vegas. Plus, I get to call Tough Enough on March 3rd. Then, the following week, I'm going out to San Jose for Bellator 292. I'll be covering that card out there. Not doing commentary, of course, but just covering it as a journalist. Uh, and I'm excited for that card, the kickoff of the Lightweight Grand Prix. That is a stacked, stacked, stacked tournament. Uh, so looking forward to being out in San Jose, California. Haven't been out there in a while. Uh, catch up with, with Scott Coker and the crew out there. So that's what I got going on March 10th. Then I'll be back March 11th. I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I'm doing on March 11th. Um, because that is, uh, as you probably know, there's a UFC fight night that night. Um, but it's the Power Slap live finale as well. I know nobody wants to talk about it because people don't like it. <laughs> but I'm still – it's crazy to me. So you got Jan versus Davalos Ridley, uh, and then you got the Power Slap live finale, both in Las Vegas on the same night. So I'm interested to see how that pans out. But then the following week, flying back out to Moncton, Calif uh, California. California. I'm not, it's not Moncton, California. I wish it was. Hopefully it won't be cold. Moncton, Canada for Fight League Atlantic 8. Uh, my new friends out there in Canada going to go out there and call another show in Moncton, uh, which I'm definitely looking forward to. Then the following week, March 25th, I'm flying to Colombia to call Empire MMA 4 in Bogota, Colombia. Um, Hector Castro and the crew there, some old friends of mine that I've known for years and years and years, and they're trying to do good things, uh, you know, in the South American scene, the Latin American scene, uh, especially based in Colombia, but looking to kind of feature fighters from all over because um, that's uh, Hector's roots. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of st big South American organizations. And, and as he said, you know, the, the, the sport is still kind of developing in those countries, and he wants to help be a part of it. He's been around the sport for a long time. Um, and he's bringing me on as a commentator for that. And then the following week, I go to Philadelphia for my good friends at CFFC because we've got back-to-back -back events, CFFC 117 and CFFC 118. So that's every weekend in March I got something going on. I got a USC the first week. I got a Bellator the second week. I got Fight League Atlantic the third week. I got Empire MMA the fourth week. And then I wrap it all up with CFFC at the end. Can't wait for that. And then i got to figure out April, man, because i got PFLs here in Las Vegas, uh, UFC 287 in Miami. Uh, CFFC 119 is uh, uh, April 20th, so I'll be in Tampa for that one. I mean, it's just the schedule is getting nuts. So uh, I'm excited about it, super, super excited about it. But uh, today gave me a chance to get caught up on a lot of things in, in real-world stuff. So uh, your boy is busy and your boy is excited about that. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's taken a while. I left a year ago and it's, you know, it's taken a while to kind of get everything going, but, um, things falling into place and, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. So, uh, just thought I'd share that little bit with you, but before we get to all that, of course, we've got this weekend and it, it's a bit, man, if you're an MMA fan, if, if you're a combat sports fan, and I'm not even going to get into, uh, the boxing that's going, <laughs> that's going on, cause I'll be honest with you. I don't care about Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. Again, I'm not a Jake Paul hater. In fact, I'm somebody that just says, I think you got to respect the guy. you got to respect his hustle. you got to respect the fact that he's committing to his craft. You know, he's he, he's not trying to half-ass his way through these boxing matches. But I don't know. This one this one just doesn't get me. It doesn't. It, it didn't speak to me. You know, when, when he uh, – when he, when he fights our, our fellow uh, MMA brethren, I think I get excited for those maybe a little bit more because it's, uh, it's our MMA guys. But this one, to me, I don't know. I just, I don't, you know, the Anderson Silva fight, I, I told you guys, that one got me excited. Um, the, the, the second Tyron Woodley fight, I was like, well, I just saw that. That one didn't really get me going. The Ben Askren fight, I, I, was, I was down for, even though I was worried. <laughs> I was still down for it. But I don't know, man. This one... This one just doesn't do it for me. So uh, kudos to everybody that wants to enjoy it and watch it. And, and, uh, and I hope it's a fun fight, but I don't think I'll be spending my money on that. But if you take that off the plate or if you keep it on your plate, maybe that's your dessert. It's on Sunday, right? So, I mean, at least it's not competing with anything. I do like the fact that they picked that Sunday time slot. Uh, and this is kind of a, a slow time, right? So there's not, uh, you know, anything big, I don't think, to compete with it on. Obviously, you know, Sundays during the NFL season would be uh, ridiculous. Um, but at this time of year, I think it's it's probably good. So, you know, 
Wish them all the best out there in Saudi Arabia. But whether that's on your plate or not, listen, you got BKFC 36 on Friday. You got one on Prime Video 7 on Saturday, on Friday. Uh, you got PFL Challenger Series on Friday. Then on Saturday, you've got Bellator 291, and you've got UFC Fight Night 220. I mean, come on. If you're a fight fan, I get it. There's going to be some people that say, ah, oh, there's oversaturation, this, this, and that. I get it. Totally get it. Nobody's asking you to watch everything. But if you're like me, and this is pretty much all you watch anymore because uh, I don't watch a whole lot of other sports, I got a lot of stuff to pick from, and I'm, and I'm excited about that. So, uh, of course, uh, first on Friday morning, uh, or Friday evening, I guess I should say, Saturday morning over in Thailand, one on Prime Video 7. Good card there. Um I did a little preview video for it, starting to uh, work on a little preview video with those guys. So uh, we're calling it one-on-one, -on -one, where I just give a 60-second a shout-out as to what uh, I'm looking forward to most of, of their events. And uh, it's pretty easy for this one. Um, I mean, obviously, the main event is what you're looking forward to most, right? You've got John Lineker, Fabrice Andrade. Uh He says it differently. I don't know if he says it differently or the announcers say it differently. And it, it, I get, I get tongue-twisted on it because – like we say Jessica Andrade, right? Now, before we knew that that was the pronunciation, you probably would have said Andrade. But now we know there's that Rio uh, pronunciation, and uh, so it's Jessica Andrade. But one, they say Fabricio Andrade. And I don't know if that's just him, his preference. I should have asked him. I interviewed him, and I didn't ask him, and I probably should have. I, you know what? I get kind of embarrassed on phone. In, in person, I don't get embarrassed. In phone, or like video interviews, I get kind of embarrassed like asking somebody how, how they say their name. Because I feel like that means I didn't prepare or I didn't uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I never want to look <laughs> ill-prepared. Uh, but it stood out to me. So because it stood out to me, I should just mention that, right? That the broadcasters normally say Andrade. Is that right? Anyway, John Lineker, Fabricio Andrade, or Andrade, however you want to go about it. The rematch is here. It's a good one, man. It's a good fight. Now, the first time around, if you saw the first fight, John Lineker, of course, the name you know, he's fun. But, you know, Fabrizio Andrade, uh, Wonder Boy, we'll call him that. Uh, but it's Wonder Boy is in two words, so it's not the same. There you go. All right. It's a little bit different. Um, was getting kind of the better of the exchanges, especially as the fight was wearing on. And then uh, Fabrizio landed a, a low blow, shattered the cup of John Lineker. Uh, Lineker couldn't continue. The flight, fight was declared a no contest. Now, there's always going to be some animosity there, right? Because how many low blows do we see and how many do we see that, uh, you know, render a fighter unable to continue? Not many. I mean, we've seen it a couple times over the years, right? But not a ton. Um, and then you always wonder. And again, I, look, I'm not saying it's about John Lineker. I'm just saying from the outside looking in, right? Oh, he wasn't getting the best of it. Maybe he's looking at this as a, as a way out, you know, a way to a way to reset. He had already lost the title because he, he was overweight um, and got stripped of the belt. So he wasn't going to win the belt either way. Um, so you think, oh, well, maybe it was just his convenient way out. I'm not accusing him of that. I'm just saying that could be the story from the outside looking in. Um, now they got the rematch. When I talked to Fabrizio, uh, he wasn't disrespectful by any stretch. You know, he said, look, I was angry afterwards, but, um, you know, I got over it. I understood it, what happened happened. Nothing I can do about it now. Just got to move forward and focus and do better. Uh, could have been a little bit more patient, you know. I, I think I rushed things a little bit, and um, you know, thought Lineker would be more aggressive than he was. So anyway, they're gonna run it back. Looking forward to it. Uh, John Lineker, of course, is a client of uh, my good friend uh, Alex Davis. Of course, my my uh, has been a good friend of mine for years and years. My kid actually trains uh, at his school. He opened up an American Top Team uh, here in Henderson. And uh, my kid trains there. So obviously a good friend of mine. Uh, he's out there in Bangkok, Thailand with John Lineker. And of course, you know, it's his client. It's his friend. Um, but he has told me, he's like, look, if people think this is the same John Lineker, they're wrong. This dude's dialed in. This dude's ready to go. Uh, he's, he's more focused. You know, that was kind of an eye-opener for him. Uh, he's dialed in. So anyway, definitely looking forward to that one. That's going to be a, a great rematch. And I love it on Amazon, man. It's, uh, it's at a normal time. Basically... It works out so that uh, we get home from my, my kids' uh, jujitsu and we can watch the the main card right there uh, on Amazon Prime. And I love it because, you know, a lot of the ones for years and years, I just – I'd end up watching the highlights because, you know, or I'd just play it in the background because I'm not – you know, I wouldn't wake up at 4 a.m. So when I – you know, when I did wake up, I'd throw it on. And um, it's just – it's live sports, right? When it's not live, it's hard to give it your full attention, especially if you've already seen the results and you already know what's happening. So – you end up just kind of watching the highlights or, 
um, you know, like I said, letting it play in the background, just kind of listening to commentary there and catching it that way. But now I'm actually able to watch it live. And I love the fact um, – the second part, so, so there's three things that I was really focused on. And it's I, I, I kind of didn't mean for it to be this way, but it's what I love about um, their cards now is that they have these different arts. Um, but the co-main event, Muay Thai, uh, featherweight title on the line, Taiwan Chai, PK Sanchai against Jamal Yusupov. And I know that I say those names and most people are going to be like, what, who? I totally understand that. I think for most people, the kickboxers and the Muay Thai fighters, you don't know who they are, right? Um, but it's in four-ounce gloves. <laughs> and I hate to say it, but that's all you need to know. It's Muay Thai and four-ounce gloves. These are the best strikers on the planet, and they're not wearing boxing gloves anymore, right? They're wearing the tiny MMA gloves, and it changes everything. So, like, in my preview, I didn't even try to break down the matchup or tell you why you should care about who's fighting. You're just like, bro, it's Muay Thai and four-ounce gloves. Uh, go, go check it out. Uh, and, and I mean that, man. I think it's uh, – I, I really – I have found it to be so uh, incredibly exciting, uh, these matchups. I'm trying to see if they have their records on their website. Some of the – it's crazy because, like, the uh, the Muay Thai fighters, you know, they start fighting when they're, like, 10 years old. And it's kind of hard to find their records, but some of the – some of them, they put their records on there. Um, no, nah, they don't have it on the website, at least I'm seeing now. But these guys will be, like – 175 and 10 and 4. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, you have 300 fights? What are you, t- you know, cause they fight every week for the time they're like 10 years old. So I'm excited for that one. And then the other one that I'm really looking forward to, I mean, and not that I'm, you know, not looking for everything else, but Danielle Kelly's on the card as well, uh, doing submission grappling, moving up in weight a little bit. So it's a little bit of a challenge for there. She's, she's small, uh, having stood beside her a couple times when she was competing um, for Fury Grappling. Like, she is tiny. Uh, but she's fighting uh, Ayaka Miura, who is a former MMA title challenger, judo black belt, uh, and has that kind of uh, signature scarf hold, arm lock uh, position that she uses to her advantage. Uh, it was funny. I talked to Danielle. She broke it down. She was just like, yeah, I, I know. I was like, have you, you know, have you studied the position a little bit? I mean, do you study your opponents and what they do and kind of tendency? And she just broke it. I mean, she broke it down so flawlessly. She's like, yeah, we'll see what she does when she can't strike. Is she, uh, she fakes the double leg and that forces you to sprawl out and keep your hips away. And then because you're keeping your hips away, then she grabs your head and arm. She thanks you for the throw. And then she gets into that scarf hold position. I was like, and then she kind of laughed because she had like detail and analytics as to exactly what Mira does. And she does. She does it the same way every time. Um, but it was so funny because she, she broke it down like minute for minute. And she's like, so yeah, <laughs> I've been studying her a little bit. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I guess you have. Uh, but I, she's, Danielle is awesome. She's, uh, you know, she's, uh, uh, a phenomenal grappler and, and anytime I get to call somebody's matches uh, I, I get more invested in them right away right and we got to see her come through Fury Grappling before uh, one championship snatched her up and took her over there so uh, looking forward to those but uh, there's you know a couple submission grappling matchups on there a little bit of kickboxing a little bit of Muay Thai uh, so that is Friday morning one on Prime Video 7 there's also uh, the um PFL Challenger Series is going to continue on. Of course, PFL, man, they're coming to uh, they're coming to Las Vegas in April. So uh, excited to see that they're they're actually going to be in that same venue that the UFC is going to be on March 11th, which is the the theater at Virgin Hotels, I believe it's called. Um, which essentially, not essentially, I mean it, it is the uh, the old joint uh, at the Hard Rock. So the Hard Rock, if you've ever been there, um, there were two joints. Gosh, now I'm trying to remember. They move properties or they just move buildings in there? Man, I've been in Vegas so long, I can't even remember where they all <laughs> where they all changed names. There was an old joint. No, the old joint was an entirely different room because I remember because it was, it was small. Uh, so anyway, uh, they'll, be, they'll be at the joint, and uh, it's but it's now called the theater. Um, and so they'll be that in April. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. And uh, they got the Challenger Series coming up this week. I believe it is the women this week, right? I can't, I'll lose track of it. Yeah, women's flyways this week. So those are worth watching as well. Uh, you can check that out on uh, – is it uh, – it's free. I always lose track of that. Fubo, Fubo Sports, because I think there's a difference between Fubo and Fubo Sports. Um, and the Fubo Sports is free, uh, and then they try to sell you on the package. We don't have to have um, the package to watch it. You can watch it free. So that will be on Friday. And then 
Uh, there's BKFC as well. Uh, I did get a chance to talk to James Lilly. He's in the co-main event. Uh, he's an interesting dude. He's the warrior poet. He actually is uh, writing poetry in his spare time when he's not bare knuckle boxing. Uh, so that that's on the YouTube channel if you want to check that out. Um, I, I just thought it was an interesting cat, but it was funny. He was like, I get way more nervous to do a poetry reading than I do to go in there for a bare knuckle cage fight. So I uh, look forward to that. But that's the co-main event. Uh, I talked to him a, a few weeks earlier, but the one I'm really, really excited about is uh, the main event. And you got... Uh, you got the champ, Arnold Adams, uh, putting his belt on the line against Alan Belcher. The talent, Alan Belcher, jacked these days. Gone are the, are, are the middleweight days back in the day in the USC. This is a straight-up 230-pound uh, savage out there, but dude, he's facing an absolute monster in, uh, in Arnold Adams as well. So uh, excited for that one. Um, BKFC app, I think, went up in price. I, you know what? I don't think you can order it anymore. Uh, I think it's now seven ninety nine. So if you have, uh, um, if you have an, uh, a subscription already, it's going to stay at four ninety nine. But if you don't have a subscription, uh, it's seven ninety nine now. But it's still, still not bad. Although, man, I was looking today. My, my, my ESPN went up to like ten ninety nine now. My Disney is up to ten ninety nine now. I think my Hulu went up to thirteen ninety nine or something like that. Uh, all these kind of introductory prices they started us off with, they're all going up now, right? Uh, I, I think I got to start looking at my – I know I'm paying more for streaming fees than I was for cable. I know I am. I got to start looking at that. I just noticed that this morning as I was catching up on my real-world stuff. I was balancing the checkbook as well and was noticing, like, everything I subscribe to now, it's all gone up. And I know everything is going up in price. It seems like all those intro prices and all that are they're gone. And BKFC is like that, but it's still only seven ninety nine. It's not a bad deal. Uh, they do a good job, so that's going to be on uh, Friday. So all that stuff coming your way on Friday and then Saturday. Um, and I love uh, I love Saturday because you got a Bell Tour and you got a UFC, um, but they're not uh, against each other, right? They're they're not um, overlapping. I hate when they go head to head because it's like I just I'm, I can't truly give both my attention at the same time so i end up watching usually one live and and let's be honest for the most part it's usually usc live unless it's those rare occasions where um you know the bell tour card is 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 the bigger card but then you go back and watch the other one it's exactly what i said earlier when it's not live and you already know the results it's just it's hard for me to get as excited about it so i like it when it goes like this where it's the european shows so they're going in the morning and then the usc will go in the afternoon and evening here in Las Vegas, uh, Yaroslav Amosov uh, returning in the main event of Bellator 291 against Logan Storley. Uh, given their stylistic matchups, it may not be the most exciting fight of all time, but it is 26-0 and against 14-1, and which is pretty damn incredible when you think about it. Um, and, of course, you know, What's even more impressive is that Yaroslav Amosov is coming back from defending his country. Now, of course, uh, these two have fought before. Split decision winner the first time around was Amosov, so this will be um, a rematch. So that adds intrigue as well. Again, you know, how exciting the fight will be, we'll see based out on their stylistic. But, I mean, the story of Amosov, I, I retweeted it last night. The, they released, I guess, the, the feature video that they're doing on Amosov. Which is crazy, man. Where you know, obviously, to to uh, you know, fighting to defend his his homeland in the Ukraine, and and I tweeted about like, hey, I don't, and and I'll just be honest, like I don't really know the whole politics behind it. I'm not trying to speak out against Russian people. It doesn't seem right. I mean, <laughs> one country invading another country doesn't sound right to me. But I I don't know what right and wrong is, and what all the the, the politics are behind it. To be honest with you, and don't always understand the relationships of those nations and part of the former Soviet Union. I, I don't, I, I'll be the first to sit here. I'm, I'm not going to give an opinion, but what I do know is that no, no matter what it is, um, you know, returning to your homeland to help defend your country is pretty unbelievable, you know, and he laid it out there of like, I, you know, to think that I have problems now that I've lived through that, to think that I have any problems whatsoever is just dead wrong. I don't have problems. Like this is, this is problems, you know? And, um, I get, and you know, they show the story, which I didn't even know the story. You know, I know there was the the picture of him uh, with his belt, you know, holding his belt, 
um, I didn't realize like his mom had like stowed it away to hide it, and then he had to go find it. And I don't know, man. It's just it's a pretty damn incredible story. So uh, that fight will be in Dublin, Ireland. The D- the Dublin fans bring it every damn time. Um, I was talking with Aaron McMahon earlier this week, the the show that we do cage side with John Morgan uh, for Grind City Media, and he was saying, you know, do you think that the Irish fans are going to be a little bit frustrated that they don't have an Irish fighter in like the main event or co-main event, and will that affect uh, the the feel in the building, their excitement level, will it, will it affect how things play out? And I, I said, and and I hope I'm not wrong, but I said I don't think it will be. I don't think it will be. That Irish fans, that fan base, man, they are unbelievable. It's usually a scene every damn time. And there are some Irish fighters on the card, you know, not in the featured fights, but you know, on the main card, you got Peter Quigley, you got Sinead Kavanaugh, uh, you got Siren Clark. I mean, you you got uh, Charlie Ward. On I mean, so there's some some fighters for there to to, to dig into. And the other thing I, that I think too, and, and I said it uh, to Eric, is I think the the and you know again if I'm wrong and you happen to be Irish and you're over there and, and you tell me different, let to let me know. But I what I've noticed over the years is that you know these regional uh, events. I mean, it's a regional event. That sounds like it's, it's when the, when these major companies like the UFC and Bellator travel to different regions of the of the world. Those regions of the world, sure want to see people that they can cheer for, right? There's always you want to have the hometown guy. You want to sell some tickets for the locals and that sort of thing. But I feel like they want to see in person the people that they see on TV, right? I used to hear that from the Europeans. I used to hear that from the Brazilians. You know, when I was traveling a lot more, the fan base would be like, hey, man, you know, here's this UFC card, and it's basically, you know, a, a, a Cage Warriors card. Or, hey, you know, we're in Brazil, and they're like, ah, oh, this is basically a Jungle Fights card, right? It's, and, and you know, not when they were doing pay-per-views, but you think back to when the UFC was doing like eight Brazil shows a year. They weren't bringing championship-level action every time. And you would hear that from the fans of like, I've seen all these guys. Like, I've seen them on the regional stage. Like, I want to see what I see on TV. You know, I want to see what I can't you – know, I, I, I can't go to Las Vegas and buy the big ticket. I can't afford to go to Madison Square Garden. Like, bring me some of those people to see. So I think that, I think the Irish fan base is still going to show out for this. Um, but we'll see. Uh, excited to see Norbert Novini Jr. return. That that dude has a ton of promise. Um, so somebody you need to pay attention to. Um, dad was an Olympic medalist, uh, and but uh, ended up with some, I think some, knee, I believe it was knee issues that kept him out for a long time. Um, but he's a name that's returning. You got Hassan Magomedsharipov on the card as well. So um, yeah, we'll check that one out on Saturday morning. Then of course Saturday afternoon we'll get to UFC Fight Night 220. The Kita Krilov versus Ryan Spann. And uh, I will be there for that, even though I missed me today. I'll also be there for the weigh-in, so we'll do another chat on Friday morning. That was fun to, to catch up. Hadn't done one of those uh, in quite some time, so we'll do that on Friday morning. Do have some business meetings going on this week as well. Uh, Rob Haydack is heading out from CFFC and uh, meeting with uh, the folks over at the UFC and Fight Pass and talking about the, the remainder of the year and some other things that are in the works. So we'll share all those details as soon as we can. But I will be there for the weigh-ins uh, so we can chat some MMA, and then, of course, I'll, uh, I'll be there for the fight cart as well. Uh, main event, it's a meaningful one, right? I mean, Ryan Spann, Nikita Krilov, uh, ranked light heavyweights, of course, and, and that division is kind of wide open right now, right? I mean, to me, uh, you know, I don't know that either of these guys is, is knocking on the door of a title shot, but... During the media day today, Ryan Spann said uh, that he was in the discussion for that title shot, which I don't think I had heard before. Um, that you know, as all that stuff was unfolding with the light heavyweight title, he was one of the names that was that was mentioned in there. Um, it is uh, number six in Krilov, number uh, it was tied for eight with Volkan Uzdemir. It seems for for uh, Ryan Spann. <laughs> Uh, looking at my rankings, I have both of them lower than that. <laughs> I'm just I'm just a crotchety old man that has people lay out, uh, lower down in the rankings. Uh, but anyway, uh, not, not that far down. I have him at uh, I have Krilov at nine in my vote and eleven with Span with Uzdemir in between them at ten. Uh, all right, here's my light heavyweights. I still have John Jones in there. I know some people. Probably, I'm the only I'm the only voter that still has John Jones. And I, I verified that this week with the uh, with the committee that's tested all up. I'm like, I I, I I was trying to ask him, you know, what we're gonna do with two, 285 is, 
you know, is Jones still going to be eligible at light heavyweight? And they wait to hear. The UFC uh, has some say into in where people get ranked and what divisions they're in and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm the only guy that has Jones. So here's my rankings. Jamal Hill champ, obviously. I have Prohaska, Ankalaya, Blahovic, Jones, Rakic, Smith, Walker, Craig, Krilov, Uzdemir, Span, Krut, Roundtree, Jacoby, and Mirzakhanov. Uh, so, big fight. Like I said, I don't think it's a number one contender type fight, but given the fact that you got a brand new champion, given the fact that you know you had the weird draw uh, up there uh, but between Blahovic and, and Ankalaya, which kind of took some steam off them, even though they're at the top, given that you have the dominant champion in John Jones leaving the division, this is big. It's a big fight, you know, and, and uh, Krilov, uh, you know, been around, um, certainly, you know, uh, ha- has a couple big wins in a row here. Uh, Uzdemir and Gustafsson um, did have the losses to Craig and Kalaf. I mean, you just it, it, inconsistent, I guess, is the word with Krilov, right? You just ne- – I mean, the guy has fought forever. He's got, you know, almost 40 fights to his name, but he's inconsistent. And you get weird stuff that happens, and, and you never know what's going on, and it's probably going to happen fast. Uh, meanwhile, you got Ryan Spann, who has looked incredible as well. I mean, you know, more incredible, you might say, with the finishes. With Dominic Reyes and Iwan Kutalaba, of course, he's also had the losses. He had the loss to Smith. He had the loss to Walker. Uh, but two, you know, big first-round finishes last two times out. And, of course, comes out with the revelation that um, this is the first time I've actually trained for a fight, which was crazy the last time out. Uh, unfortunately, no one at the media day followed up on that today, but I will not be casting stones as uh, I was not there to ask the question, and it should have been. Uh, I did not hear that during his session. If I did miss it, then let me apologize to everybody that was there. Uh, but I didn't hear them follow up on that because I just thought that was such a crazy statement. You know, uh, certainly he meant you know the first time I've you know tr- been committed this much. Or what have you? Not, I mean, he's always trained. I can't, I can't imagine uh, Safe Saoud just, you know, letting somebody lollygag in there. I've been, I've been in there for some practices at Fortis in May, and you know, you, you guys hear Safe Saoud screaming uh, from the corner. You think he doesn't do the same thing in the in the practice room? Hell yeah, he does. Even more, he's screaming at him. Uh, you know, they're sweat all over the mat because they're in this, you know, room. This, I mean, it's. They put in work. So I, when you know, when he said that, I, t- I do take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. I mean, maybe, um, you know, he's, hey, I'm more focused on recovery. He did say that, you know, he's got like a nutritionist with him. He's got like a sports t- t- scientist. I, you know, he's got like his whole team of people with him. He stayed in an Airbnb so he could have, you know, house all these people around him. And, um, you know, t- as he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do things like a champion does in, in order that I can get championship results, you know. Um, and I applaud that. To, you know, to, I get it, right? In the beginning, you can't afford all those luxuries. And as you move up the ranks, you know, you start to add add things. You know, um, the diet always seems like it's one of the last ones to really get cleaned up. You know, you'll hear people, ah, I made it all the way to the UFC title and I was eating fast food or whatever, you know. Um, you know, when you hire a chef, how much it changes your diet, uh, that sort of thing. Um, you know, the, the personal, physical therapist, whatever. You know, all these things that you can add that make that, – that, that make – that basically just investing in yourself, he's doing now. So, you know, I think a lot of got, got made out of that quote, and I can understand it. And, and but I think take that with a little grain of salt. Like I know that he's been putting in work, but it's a big opportunity for him. So, uh, definitely looking forward to seeing what plays out here. Um, I kind of like Span. I feel like he's. A little bit more in form, and I do believe he is kind of clicking now and hitting that stride, whereas I feel like Krilov, not that he's not necessarily, you know, he's got a couple wins in a row as well, but it's just he's kind of up, down, up, down, up, down, whereas I feel like Span's kind of really uh, gaining that momentum. He's a dog here as well, so, um, yeah, I guess I'll have to take a look at at, uh, at, at the face-offs and, and the weigh-ins and, and see all that, but I kind of lean towards Span as the dog here. Uh, I don't know if that's crazy or not. I, I kind of feel like this might be his time to shine. Uh, that gym seems like it's it's kind of clicking right now, man. And and he seems like he's reading the pivots. His last two stoppages have been very very impressive. So kind of leaning a dog right now. Uh, co-main event is a good one, of course. Andre Muniz, Brendan Allen, big opportunity for Brendan Allen, who has you know been kind of. Uh, just on the outside of, of the middleweight rankings for a long time. And this is an opportunity in facing Andre Muniz to to break into him. Muniz is on that, that crazy win streak. 
Um, but, you know, the last time out, you know, the win against Uriah Hall didn't exactly look great, right? Kind of led you to believe, like, oh, maybe this this isn't the can't-miss blue-chip prospect that I, that I thought he was. Um, and that was his only fight all of last year. So you know, some question marks there, you know. Um, but Brendan Allen came in today and said, hey, listen, I'm uh, – I'm very aware of what Andre Muniz is good at. Is jujitsu solid? Um, I get that. He was like, but you know, I, I, I the jujitsu for MMA, I feel like I can match him with, you know, move for move. You know, maybe not if, it, if we were in a, you know, IBJJF competition or whatever. You know, but he said, look for MMA, I, I feel capable that I can deal with his jujitsu for MMA. So we'll see. Brandon Allen, the dog there as well, and I understand why. Again, Allen's kind of on the outside. He's has him. Um, you know, some moments uh, along the way that, you know, may lead you to wonder um, where he's going to be at. Uh, But, I don't know. To me, still has Muniz. So, I'm I'm, I'm high on Muniz. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grappling fan, right? Like, jiu-jitsu is what got me this. I think, uh, you know, seeing Hoist Gracie, I've said this a million times, seeing Hoist Gracie triangle choke a man where I was, where, when I learned, like, dude, you can choke somebody with your legs? Like, what? Um, that got me into it. So, I love, like, I'm, I'm, I love the grappling side of things. So, I'm a big Andre Muniz guy. But um, I, I like Brendan Allen, too, just as a person. And uh, I guess I'm kind of pulling for him. He's, he's, he's a really nice guy. And I do think that he's got some great grappling as well. And I think he's always been kind of a little bit underrated. Um, you know, had the big the big win last time out over Jocko. That was huge. Um, and just maybe he doesn't necessarily get the love that, that he deserves. You know, only losses, you know, Chris Curtis and Sean Strickland. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm intrigued by this one. So we'll see how that one plays out. Like, I'm, I, I, I kind of like a little dog here too, maybe. I kind of like a little dog here too. Uh, Augusto Sakai, Dante Mays, uh, big time heavyweight fight there. Uh, but the, the the one you gotta well let me I'm gonna throw it out there because it's on the main card. Mike Malat and Johan Lines. Uh, I hate the UFC for this fight. I absolutely hate the UFC for this fight. Two CFFC vets uh, going against each other. Two Canadians as well. So if you're a Canadian guy cheering for your boys, you don't know who to cheer for. But me, I'm torn. Mike Malat, Johan Lines. Malat's done some grappling as well. I mean, you taking my two guys that came to the CFFC and and uh, putting them up against each other. What are we doing? By the way. They're both huge, too. Um, they're both big dudes with hard weight cuts, man. So, I'll be interested to see you on Friday. They're massive welterweights, both of them. Malat is taller. I think Malat's like 6'1", whereas I think Johan's like 5'11 or 6 foot. Uh, so, Malat's a little bit taller, but they're both, I mean, big, big dudes. So, um, yeah, all CFSC affair. I hate you, UFC. <laughs> uh, by the way, we do have Jasmine, Jasmine Divisius as well on uh, on the card. Uh, Jezza Divisius, who I call Jezza Divicious uh, because of the way her name was spelled and because I thought that was a good marketing tool, and I think that she should use it. But, I mean, I guess you probably want your name said correctly, too, and your parents probably would appreciate it. But Vicious is pretty cool. For a fighter, Jezza Divicious. Come on. All right, but the one that I'm super intrigued by, Tatiana Suarez versus Montana De La Rosa. How can you not be pumped up for this matchup? Tatiana Suarez... To me, before the injuries, before everything that she was dealing with, before the years away, I mean, we're talking about almost four years at this point, right? I thought every bit future champion. She was one of those ones to me, you know, I always say that, you know, I look at prospects sometimes, and I and, and you look at them and you say, you know, um, I think they'll challenge for a title someday. And, and that's usually where I set my bar. It's like, I think they'll challenge for a title someday. And the reason I usually set it there is because it kind of depends on the matchup you get once you get there, right? Like, you know, if if you're a great striker, but the champion at the time is a great wrestler and you you can beat all the other strikers, you know, there's just different matchups, right? Things play out. Styles make fights, right? Certain people just have certain people's numbers. So the, usually I leave it at that. It's like, I think that person is going to challenge for a title. But Tatiana Suarez, to me, was so dominant with her wrestling that I was like, she's going to be a champ. Like, I, there's nobody in this division. Um, the same, and I know it's, a, it's a lazy comparison because people always call her like the female Habib. But I did have the same feelings about Habib as well. I was like, oh, that dude is going to be a champion. Because they're so good at, at, in a dominant form of something that nobody can stop them, right? Like, I don't know. 
and, and I guess probably wrestling is, is a big part of that, right? Because, you know, like I look at uh, Alex Bejeda. Alex Bejeda is huge, uh, thunderous power, incredible striking. And you knew when he came in, like, oh, this dude is going to be a problem. Like, he's going to knock some people out. But I didn't look at him for sure and be like, this dude is going to dominate as champion because there's a lot of people that might be able to outgrapple him. Now, I mean, not that he's not working on it, but, but I think just offensive wrestling is still such a big part of MMA um, that when you're that dominant at it, when you're that good at it, um, it just changes things. You know, it's why people are so high on Bo Nickel, right? I mean, the guy is um, a freak athlete as well, and it's not like he can't strike or he can't, but his offensive wrestling is so damn good. And the mindset to go along with it, that I am just going to steamroll over you. And I feel like Tatiana Suarez is that person. Now, lengthy, lengthy, lengthy time off. Um, so what does that do? I mean, she's at minus 750. That's crazy. That's crazy. After that many years away, and she's still got that line. Now, um, I think the matchmakers knew what they were doing here. You know, in Montana De La Rosa, what's she facing? Somebody that is a good grappler as well, but not that good. Not that good. She's good, but she's not Tatiana Suarez good. And so Montana De La Rosa is, is kind of going to have to fight outside of herself, I think, if she wants to win this fight. I think Montana De La Rosa, while she's normally like, hey, let me, you know, you know, let me wrestle and grapple you, and, and I'll be better than you there. I think she's going to have to win the striking battle here. I think she's going to have to hope that her wrestling is good enough um, and that maybe Tatiana's a little bit rusty with all the time away. Um, and that's how she wins. I, I don't think Montana is going to be able to take Tatiana down at will. Uh, I, I don't know that the scrambles will be great for her grappling-wise. I think she's going to have to strike. But – Montana does have the advantage of the fact that she's actually been active, right? She, um, she's she been fighting, you know? And so the timing hopefully could go in her favor. But uh, I like Tatiana in this fight. I do. And I think the matchmakers kind of knew what they were doing. Now, Tatiana did, interestingly enough, say today um, that, hey, I, I plan on going down to 115 after this. Like, this was just an opportunity for me to get in there. Um and I had read earlier where she said she only walks around at like 130 or something like that. So um, we'll see. I want to see. I guess we'll see the, the face-offs here as well and figure out um, is, is size. Gonna be, but is she? I mean, I don't think of Montana as like this huge hulking flyweight. So maybe it won't matter at all. But if you're basically just a straw weight that's not cutting – does that cause problems? Maybe it will. Maybe it will. I don't know. I don't think it will, but it's something to consider as well. So uh, I'll definitely be interested in seeing the face-offs on Friday morning. So if you want to tune into the live stream, we can talk about it then. <laughs> uh, but I, I am—I was happy to hear that, she's, that, that uh, Tatiana is going back down to straw weight as well because I, if she's still there, and we got to see it. after this many years away, we don't know now. Talk to anybody around her, uh, they'll tell you, like, just insane work ethic. Insane work ethic. Um, so, you know, it's not as if she's been chilling on the couch for the past four years. She's been in there grinding, chasing this dream of getting back to it. Um, so the work's been there. I'm anxious to see, though, is the timing still there? Is, every, is everything, is that feel still there? You just, you can't recreate a fight 100% in the gym. You just can't. You can't. You can't go full speed. Um, so we'll see where she stands, but I'm excited to see her back because if she's still that same Tatiana, watch out 115, watch out 115 because I thought she had every bit the look of a champion before, and I don't see why that would change. So, um, we'll see what she brings. I'm excited to see her return. Good to see her back, man. She was hobbling around on crutches, man. She would come to the fights, and you know, big fight fan. So, uh, yeah, uh, Jordan Levitt. Victor Martinez, Joe Selecki, Carl Deaton, O'Day Osborne, Charles Johnson. Circle that one. That should be a lot of fun. Late replacement there. Uh, Rafael Alves is here against Narula Aliyev. Uh, that could be very fun as well. Haley Callen versus Alien Perez. Uh, Jose Johnson, Garrett Arnfield, Eric Gonzalez versus Trevor Peak. This to me on this card to me on paper looks like a, a lot more fun than last week's was. Uh, last week, man, it, it's something about when you have all those those light heavyweights and those heavyweights. 
you know that either you're going to have some big finishes, like you're going to have some big knockouts and, and whatever the case may be, or you're going to get some kind of slow plotting type fights. And, of course, you know, we had the William Knight fight in there, which was, was crazy. feel bad for William Knight, man. Um, I saw the statements that, that he put out, and I'm I, you know, glad – Kudos to him, I guess, that he owned up to it. You know, he didn't try to make any excuses, which I think is fair. It was a, a, a not a good performance, but um, I don't know, man. You just hear, like, the hate that people get and the messages they get. And, look, I don't see it on that level, but I, I, I get some ridiculous DMs and stuff sometimes where I'm like, really? Is this what you do in your spare time? Like, you just reach out to, to, to spew hate to people, to talk trash to people? I don't get that, man. Like that dude in the uh, the, the Mardi Gras parade for Dustin Poirier. Like, what are you thinking, man? What are you thinking? Ah, I don't get people, man. I do not get people. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I feel bad for William Knight because he was saying that he was getting a bunch of harassment and like some death threats and whatever else, man. Uh, yeah, that Dustin Poirier thing. Did anybody ever figure out what that dude was doing? Like, he had to be like promoting his youtube channel or something right i mean i saw the video where it's like oh look what i'm about to do and just what a jackass especially because you're not even talking like it's one thing to talk trash to somebody it's nothing to talk trash about somebody's wife you know they always say you know you bring friends family uh that kind of stuff into it that's that's trash man i just ah bugs me bugs me to no end why people are like that um so, yeah, I feel bad for William Knight. Uh, released from his contract. I think fought out his contract, right? So that was the end of it. Uh, was not renewed. I mean, understandable, right? That's going to be tough. It's, I'm going to be really interested to watch William Knight's next fight because, um, man, you start to talk about, like, mental blocks and things like that, uh, and that can really, really affect your performance in there. So I'll be very, very intrigued by his next fight and, and to, to see what he does uh, coming out next time. Ho hopefully he just goes up there and, steamroll somebody or at least comes out there and looks incredible and, and you know gets that fire back he's such a he's a nice dude and uh you hate to have to deal with that so anyway uh all right listen you see fight night 220 i'll be the air so we'll uh we'll have a and a half version uh episode over at uh, patreon.com slash the mma road show wrapping up everything that happens at usc fight night 220 but we'll probably be talking a little bit of everything because it's a crazy busy ass weekend there's so much MMA and combat sports to watch, and I won't even judge you if you tell me you're watching Jake Paul on Sunday too, because we're fight fans, right? It's what we do. And if you want to tune in, you tune in. <laughs> I just don't know. If it was all right, I'm gonna be honest with you. If it was free, I would watch it. If it was free, I would watch it. I just don't think I could pay sixty bucks for it. Or is it fifty? I think it's forty nine ninety five. Is it fifty? I don't think I could pay for it. I don't think I could justify that. Nah. No, nah, I'll probably end up buying it. <laughs> I think I'll probably end up buying it. I don't like missing out on stuff. I like watching all that stuff. I'm not even interested in it. But I'll tune in to watch the show because I love this stuff. Uh, all right, back to work now. I'm going to finish up some things and then head to my kid's soccer practice. Uh, cold Coffee, I'm sure, misses the opportunity to talk to. But he was probably so pissed off that I didn't show up at media day. It's probably better off that I don't talk to him because he's probably mad at me. So send him your love. <laughs> And uh, appreciate the support. And, of course, more than anything, thanks for listening.